All right. Um, my name's John Werner. I'm the minister to men here at Portland Community Church, um, which means I work with about half of this group on a regular basis. We, uh, uh, among other things, we've got a regular breakfast on Saturday mornings, uh, bright and early at 7 a.m., uh, and if uh, you are of the male gender, I would encourage you to join us if you haven't already. We have a great time, hot breakfast, a uh, good time discussing uh, God's Word and some great interaction. Very provoking uh, time. Um, when I was in eighth grade, and I can remember this distinctly, isn't it interesting how you can remember stuff uh, at any age, from all ages that you are, uh, even though it's been a couple of years now, but I remember when I was in eighth grade, for whatever reason, um, the uh, youth pastor drafted me to sing a solo at the Sunday evening church service. Now, I wasn't terribly nervous about it. I didn't know enough to be nervous uh, at that point. Um, but my mom, as moms will do, just thought, this was wonderful. So what does she do? She signs me up for voice lessons. Honest to goodness. This is crazy. She took me down to the local Bible college, Western Baptist Bible College in uh, the Berkeley Hills. Uh, and, and curiously enough, uh, today Western Baptist has actually moved uh, north on I-5 and it is now Corbin University just outside of Salem, so same school. She took me there because my older sister uh, attended there. She was a freshman in college and uh, I was just a lowly eighth grader. But um, I took voice belt lessons for the better part of a year. Now here's the deal. This was kind of interesting. I could hit high notes really well, and they sounded okay, but the only way I could get my voice to go high was by basically making the muscles in my throat really, really constricted. So it was kind of like uh, uh, just squishing as hard as I could with my throat to pick off the high notes. The low notes were fine. I didn't have to worry about those. Here's the, the downside of this. By expending all of that effort, and even though it's just in your throat, it doesn't look like it's doing anything, I couldn't sing for more than 10 minutes before my throat was just completely worn out. I mean, a sound wouldn't even come out. And this professor uh, of music, again, working with me for a whole year, got really frustrated. It was like, John, you have got to just let go. You've got to release. You've got to stop trying to force your voice to do it. You've got to let those muscles relax. That's the way you're going to be able to do this. And about a year into this, and I remember I stopped taking lessons right after uh, I had my epiphany, I was singing some classical song for him, you know, some Schubert or Schumann piece. Uh, it had nothing to do with eighth graders. Um, and all of a sudden, it just happened. I hit these high notes, and it was absolutely effortless. It was like I had released everything and all of a sudden this, this uh, really cool sound just came out th and, the, and the music professor was like, wow, that's it, that's it. His secretary even came in and says, I heard that, that was it, that's the way you want it to be, right? It was amazing. It was by letting go rather than holding on that I was able to get that. It gave me the ability to sing for the long haul, not just for 10 minutes. Um, now, I don't sing much anymore, uh, except in church with the rest of you, but I still have that ability to sing high notes without it bothering me. Um, why do I bring this up? Well, I bring it up because we are going to be talking about that this morning. Um, it is letting your voice go. And it's a metaphor for what the Bible is talking about in the third chapter of Galatians. Now, before we jump into it, uh, and, and I do want to just kind of give that as our overarch, many of you have heard the phrase, let go and let God. That's really where we're focusing and where we're heading in this morning. But let me open us with a word of prayer before we go any further. Father God, thank you so much uh, for your desire to have a relationship with us. And Lord, for your desire as a part of that to reach out to us in conversation. And that conversation is in the Bible. Lord, we're grateful for these words, and I pray that you would help us to uh, uh, take them into our brains and let them sift down and filter down into our hearts. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, your only Son, Jesus. Amen. Now, before I jump into Galatians 3, I want to give us a little bit of background, some of which you may have heard, some of it perhaps not. Galatia is 
uh, an area that is in the northern region of what today is Turkey. And Paul was based out of Antioch for all of his, um, that's right there on the right-hand side of that map, for all of his uh, missionary journeys. And it's believed that the very first of three missionary journeys that Paul took went through the area of Galatia, and he planted churches. Uh, stayed a couple months at one location, uh, maybe uh, six months at another, a few months at another, and he planted all these churches. Now, these churches, even though Paul was a Jew, were primarily all Gentiles, non-Jewish believers uh, that were in these churches. And um, Paul starts every one of his letters uh, with, with high praise, something having to do with uh, the people, like the book of Ephesians, uh, for example. Um, uh, he says, uh, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards the saints. Well, that's a nice attaboy, isn't it? And he says the same thing to uh, the church in Thessalonica. Your faith has rings out through all of Achaia. Um, and everybody's heard about what incredible faith you folks have there in, in Thessalonica. Uh, the book of Romans, he starts off with high praise for the Romans, even though he's never personally been a part of that church. Paul does this every one of his epistles with one exception. The one exception is the churches in Galatia. Paul starts the book of Galatians, verse 6 of chapter 1, uh, and you may or may not remember this from a few weeks ago when we started this. He says, I am shocked that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you. He doesn't start with an attaboy. He kicks him in the shorts. It's like, hey, what's wrong with you guys? You bunch of numbskulls. Let's get with the program here. Have you forgotten what we, we got together for in the first place? So he rebukes them. Now, he doesn't praise them. Why is that? Because there's a problem. There's a problem in Galatia. What's the problem? In one word, the problem is Judaizers. What? What the heck is a Judaizer? Well, in simple terms, a Judaizer is somebody who is trying to convince you and persuade you to be Jewish, to follow the, their Jewish persuasion, their view of God. That's what a Judaizer is. Now, Judaizers in the first century were in two camps. You've got believing Judaizers, that is, Christians, Jews who have become Christians. They believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. He is there to save them. And through Jesus, they have eternal life. They have a relationship with God. That's cool. That's a Judaizer. But they still want to persuade you of their point of view. The second group of Judaizers are non-Christian Judaizers. They don't accept that Jesus is the Christ. Now, those Judaizers are a rough group towards Christians. So rough that they want to see Christians killed. If that Christian won't come back to their worldview, their view of who God is and the Jewish way to God, um, then they'll, they'll kill that Jew, uh, that Christian rather. This, by the way, in fact, they'll kill a, kill a Jewish Christian as well as a Gentile Christian. They don't care. If you're a Christian, you're dead. That's the way they view it. They are no different than radical jihadist Muslims of today. Same exact thing. And the Apostle Paul, before he became a believer in Jesus, was one of those non-believing radical Judaizers who saw to it that Christians right and left were killed, stoned to death, off with their heads, whatever. Uh, he was a bad dude until he had his own personal encounter with Jesus. So, Paul is writing to the Galatians with a warning about the Judaizers. Now, the people that were influencing the Gentiles, the Judaizers that were influencing them, were Christian Judaizers. But here's what they were trying to do. They were saying to the Gentile believers, which were most of that church, that's great you're a Christian, but you can't really be a Christian unless you first become a Jew. And you've got to follow all of the Jewish rituals and observances. You've got to get circumcised. You can't eat bacon. Sorry, no pork chops. You know, you've got to uh, follow all the rules of the Sabbath. Uh, you can only walk so many steps 
on the day of rest. Uh, and I mean, it's really tedious. There's a, there's a lot going on there. And they were putting some heavy, heavy burdens on the Gentile believers. And Paul's saying, wait, 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 wait. That's not what this is all about. That's not what this is all about. Uh, this is about letting go and letting God. Now, let's, uh, let's jump in here and read what Paul has to say to these Galatian believers. Verse 1 of chapter 3. You foolish Galatians. Look at that. There he is with the rebuke again, right off the bat. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was demonstrated as having been publicly executed and crucified. The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Rebuke again. Thank you, Paul. Having started with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing? Well then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? It's kind of interesting. Those five verses, Paul asks six questions. In the next few verses, he's going to answer those questions. But these are all rhetorical questions. And they're basically smacking them upside the head. Hey, pay attention. Listen to this. Did you do this? Did you do that? No, of course not. They're rhetorical questions. So the question we want to ask ourselves is, how did the Galatians receive God's Holy Spirit in the first place? Paul answers that twice. For emphasis, he says it first in verse 2. He says, um, did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Obviously, it's believing what you heard. He asks the question, but he answers it in the same question. By believing what you heard. That's how you received it. And he says the same thing again to emphasize his point in verse 5. God work, supply you with the Spirit, work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by your believing what you heard. By believing what you heard. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's, it's interesting that Paul says um, you received the Spirit and you saw miracles among you. Apparently, when Paul was there helping establish these churches, the Holy Spirit was doing a number of miracles through Paul to help uh, reinforce the message that he was giving. So these people had experienced God's miracles through the hands of Paul. They had received the Holy Spirit, but all of it through one word, belief. They believed, and so they got, uh, they got, uh, uh, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul uses a number of different words that all are very much related. The first uh, would be um, believe. Second word is faith, and the third is grace. Now, those aren't the same word, but they're all related. You can see how they kind of play off of each other. And he contrasts those with words on the other side, doing or works or the law. And then Paul sums up the net effect of each of these groups of concepts, each of these groups of words. If you have belief, if you've got faith, if you are living on God's grace, you are righteous. You are righteous because you believe. Not because you're doing something, just because you believe. And if you are trying to work out your salvation by doing something, by works, or by living according to the law, you are foolish. That's what Paul is saying the Galatians are. You are foolish. Um, it's like my voice lessons. Not trying to strangle a high note out. It's learning to just let go. Um, you want to let go and let God. Uh, God's going to take care of it. Now, let's, uh, let's go on and read the next few verses here. Uh, verse 6. And here's interesting. Paul asks six questions in those first five verses. And now he starts to quote the Old Testament six times in answer to his six questions. So he jumps right into um, the book of Genesis. And it says, Just as Abraham, quote, believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. Right there, we've got the first mention from the Bible, way back in Genesis, of the plan of salvation. 
believe. Not following rituals or laws. It's belief. Um, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. Now, I should point something out here. Um, some translations say, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in you. And in the book of Genesis, and this is in Genesis 12, by the way, that Paul's quoting from, it says, by you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth or all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that in the Hebrew actually reads two ways. Most Bibles translate it the way I just said it. By you or through you, all the nations of the earth or all the families of the earth will be blessed. But the other way that is completely, every bit as accurate, is all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. Not be blessed, but bless themselves. How does that work? It's belief. Because Abraham showed up doesn't mean you are automatically blessed. But if you believe in what God did through Abraham, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. You'll be blessed with a relationship with God, with eternal life, with salvation, forgiveness of sins, all that wonderful stuff. Now, the question um, that uh, I'd like to, to put out in front of you is how can a Gentile be blessed like Abraham from the Old Testament? Paul tells us in verse 7, uh, he says, um, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. Just by believing, you are a descendant of Abraham. Now, I want you to think about this. Many of you know this already, but it's, it, goes, uh, it bears repeating. Abraham is looked at and revered as the father of the three great world religions. You know he's the father of the Jews because this book obviously started as a Jewish document, but he is also the father of the Christians. We, most of us who are Gentiles, some of us are Jews, but uh, uh, we are adopted into God's family through our belief. So we have Abraham as our father as well through adoption. And then the third group, of course, is the Muslims and the Arabs. Uh, Abraham's first son, an illegitimate son, Ishmael, became the father of uh, the Arab slash Muslim peoples. And they regard him as their father, as their holy first father as well. Um, they don't have uh, a whole lot of interest in the Jews, as you well know, uh, because the Jews got all the rights and privileges, came with the legitimacy of Isaac, who was Abraham's uh, uh, son that came after Ishmael. But those are the three world faiths. And um, it says that we are sons of descendants of Abraham, sons and daughters of Abraham, because of our belief. But then it's also in verse 8, he says, uh, God will justify the Gentiles by faith. What's faith? It's nothing more than belief. It's belief that is putting your trust in someone or something. And that's uh, how we are justified. Justified, that means made right made righteous. It's your belief that makes you righteous. It's not coming to church on Sunday morning. It's not praying, uh, it's not praying before bed uh, Thursday evening. It's none of those things. It's by belief. Um, we want to uh, uh, take a look at something else that happened to me in eighth grade. <laughs> um, I don't know how many of you know what that is. Uh, if you're, yeah, if you're anywhere close to my age, you at least know what it is, even if you've never used it. Uh, but anybody who's under the age of probably 50, you may never have even seen it. When I was in eighth grade, um, before then and since then, actually, I'm one of six kids. Uh, and, and when school let out for the summer, my mom, who was a non-working mom, she stayed at home. She had no sense of humor with having six kids in the house. So every summer... She made sure that we went to summer school. Now, I, I don't mind telling you, I hated summer school. I wanted to be out playing baseball with my buddies. And I got to go 
back to school for six weeks. That's a long chunk of time in the middle of the summer. When everybody else is outside horsing around having a great time, I'm in there going to school. And believe it or not, in eighth grade, I don't know how I drew this, this short straw, but I had a course in slide rule. That's what that is. That's a slide rule. That is the world's, not the world's first, but it is a calculator, if you can believe that, a manual calculator. Now, if, if you can visualize this, this is something, it's an engineering tool. Engineers use this a lot. Um, you got a picture back in the 1950s of a guy wearing a, 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 a dark suit and a skinny black tie, white shirt, and in his pocket he's got what's called a pocket protector. It's a white plastic vinyl thing that sticks in there, supposedly to protect his shirt, but he still has ink stains on his shirt. And he's got two or three pens tucked into it, and he's got sticking out of it a slide rule. So he can whip that thing out and make some calculations on the fly, just like that. Well. Guess what? That was a hard course. I mean, mathematically, for an eighth grade boy, we were studying logarithms and trigonometric functions. You know, I hadn't even taken geometry in, in, you know, until my sophomore year of high school. This stuff was like, whoa, this is really daunting. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, it was really a struggle for me to pass this course in slide rule. It was some heavy duty math. A lot of very hard work. Well, today, we've got computers, we've got laptops, we've got tablets, we've got cell phones. Any and every one of these things has got Excel spreadsheets and calculators on it. I mean, you just punch a few numbers and boom, it's done for you. Who is going to take the time to screw around with a slide rule? Nobody. I mean, to even learn it is just ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. The point is, we want to work smarter, not harder. A PC is better than a slide rule. Grace is better than works. Why would we be spending so much time as believers who have been freed by the grace of Jesus to be pouring ourselves into um, works, into the law, into things like that? Again, it's going back to those, uh, those voice lessons. You want to let your voice go. Let go and let God. He wants your instrument to, be, instrument to be freed up for living a rich and a full life, not being hounded by do's and don'ts. Now, it's not just Judaizers, by the way, who lay this stuff on you. It is every one of us from time to time, you know? I want you to behave like I think a Christian should behave. And you want that person to behave like you, you think a Christian should behave. And that includes judging them for, you know, things that you think they're doing wrong. Oh, I saw that person have a glass of wine. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that person went to a dance. Oh, that person went to the movies. You know, Christians have these, these ideas about what you can do and what you can't do. And Jesus says, hey, that person has a relationship with me. They're my responsibility now, not yours, not yours. You know, so we have people trying to impose their view on us when Paul says, hey, you know, it's grace. It's not law. It's belief. It's not works. Don't, uh, don't get all tied up in a knot here uh, because of this kind of stuff. It's um, grace. It's better than works. Now, verses 10 through, uh, through 14, and we're going to, uh, wrap up with this. Um, the Apostle Paul goes on giving some more Old Testament quotes. He says, For those who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written in the book of Deuteronomy, if you were to look at your cross index file, uh, uh, the end of Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey what? All all the things written in the book of the law. Are you kidding me? I'm cursed because I don't obey all the things that are written in this book of the law. And there's a lot of law in this Old Testament. And that's, that's kind of scary. It's like, okay, thanks for playing, you know. <laughs> um, there's no point. I mean, you know, where, where is the hope? Um, the, uh, you know... How does working smarter, not harder, illustrate this concept of faith and not works? 
the Bible can be daunting if you don't take it in its totality, in its total context. If you limit yourself to the Old Testament, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Now, the Jews, those Judaizers, have got a list of 613 laws. That's how many laws the Jews count in our Old Testament. Now, anybody here think that they can adhere faithfully your entire life for all 613 of those Jewish laws and traditions? I, that's pretty daunting. I mean, there's no way I could do it. And again, that's don't eat bacon. How many steps can you take on Sunday? Um, you know, pork chops, out of, out of line, can't do it. Um, let's set the 613 aside. We're going to make it easy on you. Let's just go back to the Ten Commandments. It's what our founding fathers established as our, uh, our legal system, is the basis for our legal system. Now, you probably don't lie. Good, you passed that test. Um, hopefully you don't steal. I don't think there's anybody in here who's murdered anyone. Um, so, for the, better, for the, for the most part, uh, we're cool with the Ten Commandments. You know, but let's just pull one commandment out of those ten. There's one that everybody's guilty of. Thou shalt not covet. Oh, man. I'm driving an old beater, an old Tahoe, 1998. And I tell you, I covet a nice new pickup truck in the worst way. I can't afford one, but I really covet one. That's a sin. You know, I, I, I really covet the idea of getting my mortgage paid off. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, it's hard to go a day without coveting something, coveting a relationship with somebody that you admire. Oh, I wish I knew that person. You know, there's just too many things to covet. There's a, uh, a great uh, religious philosopher who's been dead for uh, 20, 30 years now by the name of Francis Schaeffer. And he wrote uh, a whole bunch of books. And it's it actually, uh, if you ever have a chance to read a book by Francis Schaeffer, I would highly encourage you to do that. Even though he was absolutely a brain trust, really brilliant, his books are very down to earth and very readable. And he wrote a book, uh, and I can't, the, the title of it just flew out of my head, I can't remember it. But the premise of this book is that the root of all sin is covetousness, is coveting. Any sin that you might do finds its origins in coveting. And I think he's right. It's very interesting. It's kind of the inescapable commandment. You can honor your father and mother. You can observe the Sabbath. You can not murder. But try to not covet at some point in time. I just don't know if you can do that. So there it is. Just Even if it's just one law, one commandment that you don't do, you lose. You have missed following the law and you have, according to the Judaizers or those well-meaning Christians, you have not been able to achieve your salvation. Cursed is everyone who does not follow every one of the laws that's written in the book. Wow. Paul's saying, you know, that's not the case. At the very end of his life, uh, just hours before he's arrested, Jesus had an interesting conversation with his disciples. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then he says a very interesting thing. Abide in me and you will be fruitful. I've got an apple tree in my front yard. And every year, this year is just like everyone previous, it's loaded with apples. They're Liberty apples, which I don't particularly care for. They're a little too sharp for me. But still, there's a ton of apples there. Uh, now, I go out and I look at that tree, and those branches are abiding in the main trunk of that tree. And those apples, I promise you, they are not grunting and groaning and struggling to develop as a nice, full, ripe apple. No, they're just abiding. That's what Jesus calls us to do in our relationship with God. Just abide. If you stay plugged in to your relationship with Jesus, you're going to be fruitful. You don't have to be hung up and tortured about 
do's and don'ts, messing up or not messing up, keeping your nose clean, doing stuff that other people tell you is expected of a believer, of a Christian. That's not the way that it works. Here's an interesting thing. We talk about uh, the new covenant. Um, and, uh, well, we had this issue too last time. We gave a pause here before. Let's see if we can get that slide to advance. There we go. Um, most of us have heard of the New Covenant. The New Covenant is basically the New Testament, but it comes through Jesus, and it's the covenant of grace. What's grace? It's receiving something that you don't deserve, as opposed to mercy, which is not receiving something that you do deserve. Um, but the New Covenant comes through Jesus. It's the covenant of grace. Here's the interesting thing. We, we apply that to the New Testament. Well, you got the Old Testament, that's the Old Covenant. You got the New Testament, that's the New, the new Covenant. Guess what? This New Covenant is first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 15. The first book of the Bible has got the New Covenant. I'm going to turn over there really quickly, and Paul's actually kind of already talked about it, but Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 and 6 it says, God brought Abraham outside and said, look toward the heaven and count the stars if you're able to count them. Whoops. And then he said to him, so Abraham shall your descendants be as numerous as the stars in the heaven. Now here's the verse that I like. And Abraham believed the Lord. He believed the Lord. And the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness imputed Abraham's belief as righteousness. Abraham didn't do anything except believe. And because he believed, he's righteous. Because you believe, you are righteous. You believe in Jesus. Why did Jesus come to this earth and die so that our sins could be forgiven? I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm righteous. Now, my wife will tell you, I don't think so. But in the eyes of God, past, present, and future, I am righteous. Why? Because I believe. Not because I go to church on Sunday. Not because I have a quiet time in the morning before I go to work. Not because I pray. Not because I tithe. None of those things. Those are all wonderful things. I'm not saying that they aren't. But that's not salvation. Salvation is belief, period, pure and simple. You know, it's interesting. It is, um, we also see this in Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, Hebrews 11, I, I would encourage you to look at it when you get a chance. Uh, you, you may already be very well familiar with it, but it is the, uh, the hall of fame of Old Testament heroes and heroines. Uh, it lists women and men. Uh, and it's a discussion about their faith being imputed to them as righteousness, their belief being imputed to them as righteousness. It doesn't talk about great works and deeds that they achieved or performed. It talks about their belief. And the very first one that it talks about in Hebrews 11 is Abraham. Um, that's what the Bible wants us to, do, to, 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 to get our, our brains wrapped around. Let go and let God. Don't strangle yourself. You want to be able to, to be able to let your instrument perform for the long haul. You want to let go and let God. Now, I've been teaching Men's Morning Watch, our Saturday morning group, for years. Um, uh, at this church, I've taught it at uh, other venues uh, for about 15, 16 years now. And... Um, I used to, up until just a few years ago, uh, every week uh, finish up with, here's our one takeaway, here's our one point, and it's called an application. Now, classic traditional Bible study follows three steps. Number one, we're, we're reading the Bible now. What does it say? And we read the actual words. We did that this morning. Number two, what does it mean to me? And then number three, how do I apply it in my life? So what does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply? Says means does. What, so what, what's it to you? Um, that's the process. Now, think about this logically. These guys that I meet with on Saturdays, and we have a great discussion, 
they finish Saturday morning saying, okay, John says I need to be praying at least 10 minutes every morning this week and every week. And then next Saturday, let's say it's uh, about reading your Bible. Okay, John says, I'm supposed to be reading my Bible 20 minutes a day, uh, every day. Or maybe it's just six days a week. God will give me a day of rest. But I'm supposed to be reading my Bible 20 minutes a day. And then the third week, it's something else. And you're trying so hard to do these things. And by the fourth or fifth week, your brain explodes if you really are doing what the pastor tells you to do, what the application is, I can't keep them all straight. We're almost up to 613 Jewish laws now from the Old Testament. How can I do this? I can't. So I stopped a few years uh, addressing application. So this morning, we have uh, an application. All right? What is the application? Nothing. That's your application. There is no application. Let it go. Jesus says, abide in me. Let go and let God. Let your voice be free. Let your instrument be free for what God made it to be. You're going to have uh, the ability to enjoy your relationship with God, your relationship with each other over the long haul if you let go and let God. You know, our world is filled with Judaizers, including Christian Judaizers. Don't get tied up in knots when they want to impose their view on you, even if it's well intended. God wants you to know that you have a relationship with Him that is secure no matter what your sins are, no matter what your do's are, no matter what your don'ts are. You have got a secure relationship. Uh, Colossians 3.9, we just read this, for this reason, those who believe we're just talking belief. Those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, you never intended for us to earn our salvation. No amount of hard work would cover even one violation of the law. And the Bible says that Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. That's what your grace is all about. Your son Jesus has done all the heavy lifting. We can't earn our salvation, so it's nothing for us to brag about. Jesus has done the work and all we have to do is believe. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God and not of good works, lest anyone should boast. Lord, I ask a special blessing on each person here this morning and help us to just be thrilled that we can have a relationship with you that's not dependent on our performance. We pray these things in the name of your Son, your only Son, Jesus. Amen.